Um, so it's four o'clock here in Italy, which means that typically we would just be finishing our Sunday lunch and uh, moving into the siesta phase of the day. So I will also try not to be uh, too heavy in the, in the presentation. So uh, in this session, we want to consider together the question of why preach the Old Testament prophets? And the reason why we want to ask this question is that we need to answer this question before we look at how to preach the Old Testament prophets. And uh, it doesn't make much sense to spend hours and hours looking at how to preach the prophets if we're not motivated to preach the prophets. Um, so that's what I hope to do in this, in this time together. I hope to give us some reasons why we should preach the Old Testament prophets. Now, of course, a commitment to preach the Old Testament prophets is based on a broader commitment to preaching. So I'm not going to go through a theology for preaching. I assume that because you have enrolled in this network that you believe in the value of preaching. Uh, but uh, a, a theology for preaching the prophets is, in a sense, built on a broader theology for preaching, and indeed for a broader theology of preaching the Old Testament. There are plenty of people who believe in preaching, who have a high degree of preaching, but yet spend very little time preaching the Old Testament. And if that's true of the Old Testament in general, I think it's even more true of the Old Testament prophets. I would love to do a survey among all of us as participants to see how much time we have actually spent preaching the Old Testament prophets. Of course, I can't do that, but uh, I recently went to check the sermon libraries online of the three Johns, John Piper, John MacArthur, and John Stott. And I selected the three Johns because they have a high view of scripture, they have a high view of preaching, they have been committed to preaching systematically through books of the Bible in their ministry, and they have served in one church for a period of 30 years. And when you go and check the statistics, it is remarkable to notice how little time has been invested in the Old Testament prophets. In, generally, in general, the Old Testament has been neglected but especially the Old Testament prophets. And I think that is a representation of what's taken place across the world. I think when you look at the Old Testament, I think there has been a resurgence of preaching narrative over the last few years. I think the Psalms have always done pretty well, but I think we tend to neglect the Old Testament prophets. And the reason why it's important to preach the, the Old Testament prophets is because we're called to preach the whole counsel of God. That is our calling. And we cannot neglect, we cannot afford to neglect such a large part of the biblical canon. If you take from Isaiah to Malachi, that portion of scripture of the prophetic literature is similar in size to the entire New Testament. So if we're not preaching the Old Testament prophets, we are neglecting a significant part of Scripture. And this commitment to the entirety of Scripture, um, the, the Reformers really believed in not neglecting any part of Scripture. And they used the slogan, Tota Scriptura. Now, we probably are more familiar with the slogan, Sola Scriptura. And Sola Scriptura is the refusal to add anything to scripture. It's the recognition that scripture alone is the source of special revelation. But the other side of the coin is tota scriptura, which is the refusal to subtract, subtract anything from scripture. It's the commitment to embrace the entirety of God's special revelation. And so we must hold to both sola scriptura, but also tota scriptura. And the reformers practiced what they, what they preached. If you compare John Calvin to the other three Johns, it is remarkable to look at John Calvin's statistics. He preached 343 sermons from Isaiah. 
He preached 174 sermons from a book of Ezekiel. 174 <laughs> from Ezekiel. And he preached 17 sermons from a book of Ze Zephaniah. Uh, reportedly, John Calvin preached all of the books of the Bible apart from Revelation. But that's what Toda Scriptura looks like in practice. So what I would like to do is to try to convince you this afternoon of the value of preaching the prophets. I don't want to just guilt trip you by comparing you to John Calvin, but I want to see if I can give you convincing reasons to preach the prophets. And there are three main reasons why I think we should preach the prophets. The first is the example of Jesus and the New Testament writers. The second is the value of the message of the prophets. They have a unique voice that we must hear. And the third is a bonus reason for us preachers. The prophets were great communicators. And I think if we spend time with the prophets, we will learn to communicate effectively. So let's look at each one of those in turn. So first of all, the example of Jesus and the New Testament writers. And one of the staggering discoveries that I recently made is to uh, see how much Jesus used the prophets to disclose his identity. Now, there's a great, um, connect, a great push, a big push in our day to connect the Old Testament to Christ. So you'll have people like Gridanus and the Gridanus saying, that we will miss the heart of the prophecy when we fail to link it to Jesus. And so we see many uh, books, many scholars, many preachers today pushing us to connect the Old Testament to Christ. And I believe that it's essential to connect the Old Testament to Christ. And I believe it's also essential that unless we connect the Old Testament to Christ, we're missing the heart of the prophecy. But I also think it's important to remember that this relationship is bi-directional. I think we could take this uh, sentence of Gridanus and reverse it, invert it. I think we will miss the heart of the identity and mission of Jesus when we fail to link him to the prophets. If we don't link Christ to the prophets, then our understanding of Jesus will be limited. Think of how many images and how many titles of Jesus come from the prophets. If you think of Jesus as the Messiah. Now we know that Jesus didn't really use the title Messiah for himself. However, he never denied that he was the Messiah. But he hinted several on several occasions that he was the Messiah that the people were waiting for. And the New Testament writers recognize Jesus as a promised Messiah because they highlight the many messianic prophecies that find their fulfillment in Jesus. And so if we want to understand Jesus as a Messiah, we need to look back to the prophets. Another title, which was the, the favorite title for himself that Jesus used more than 80 times throughout the Synoptic Gospels, is Jesus as the Son of Man. And again, this is a title that comes directly from the prophets, particularly from Daniel 7, but also from the book of Ezekiel. Or again, if we want to understand Jesus as the servant of the Lord, this is another key title. And the authors of the New Testament and Jesus himself referenced himself as the servant of the Lord at his baptism, in several healings, and even before his death. So if we want to understand Jesus, if we want to understand his full identity, then we need to turn to the prophets. And if we don't allow the prophets to disclose the identity of Jesus, our understanding of Jesus will be limited. Here I've given you three examples. The Messiah, the Son of Man, the servant of the Lord. But we could also consider Jesus as the prophet. We consider Jesus as the priest, Jesus as the king, the new David. 
all of these titles and offices of Jesus, we will only be able to understand them if we connect Jesus back to the prophets. And no wonder Jesus invested quite, quite some time with the disciples after the resurrection to explain to them how the Old Testament, included the, including the prophets, spoke about him. But it's not just the identity of Jesus which is disclosed by the prophets. The prophets also shaped the teaching of Jesus. And it's remarkable to notice how many, uh, how much of Jesus' teaching refers back to the prophets. And even some of the more memorable images that Jesus used, they actually come from the prophet, the prophets. Think of the language of the spring of living water that comes from Jeremiah. Think about the language of the, the vine and the vineyard. Again, that comes from the prophets from Isaiah 5. Think about the language of being born again or born from above and the background of that conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus from Ezekiel 36 and 37. Think about the language of fishers of men, bride and groom, light of the world, the cup of God's wrath, the den of robbers, shepherds, harvest. All of this language is loaded language. And Jesus knew that this was loaded language. And all of this language comes from the Old Testament prophets. Now, some of this language is also used elsewhere in Scripture. For example, for example the imagery of a shepherd in the Psalms, Psalm 23, for example. But primarily, this language that I have listed in this slide comes from the Old Testament prophets. So I maintain that unless we know the message of the prophets, not only we will miss uh, to understand the true identity of Jesus, but we will have serious difficulty even in understanding some of his teaching. And we also see the importance of the Old Testament prophets by looking at how the New Testament writers quoted the Old Testament. Let me just give you some examples. In the very beginning of the book of Acts, we see on a number of, of occasions that the apostles used the prophets to demonstrate that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. Or another important moment, a decisive moment in many ways for the early church, was the conference in Jerusalem. And James resolved the conference by quoting a passage from the book of Amos. Or think about Paul and his doctrine of salvation. Uh, Paul, both in Romans and in Galatians, he quotes Habakkuk to teach the people that the righteous shall live by faith. And I think the author of Hebrews also picks it up again. Or think of Peter. Peter says that he considers the prophetic word to be more sure than even his own experience of the transfiguration. Or consider, for example, the book of John, uh, the book of Revelation. John in the book of Revelation, he doesn't quote directly from the Old Testament, but his book is saturated with allusions to the Old Testament, especially allusions to the Old Testament prophets. So if we're looking at the example of Jesus and the apostles, we see that they give so much importance to the prophets and we must follow their example. But more generally than that, if you consider the totality of scripture, you've probably seen this kind of um, image before where you look at the story of scripture go going from creation to the new creation. And you notice how many of the big themes that start in Genesis find their conclusion in uh, Revelation 21 and 22, and how many of these big themes find their centerpiece in Christ. So you have traje several trajectories, such as covenants, marriage, cities, temple, nations. All of these big biblical themes 
that run through the totality of scripture, they are significantly advanced in the prophets. It's the prophets that announce the new covenant. Moses hints at it in the book of Deuteronomy, but it's the prophets that announce that one day there will be a new covenant. And so if you're attempting to understand any of these biblical trajectories, if you don't understand and pay attention to the message of the prophets, you will be limited in your understanding. And as New Testament believers, as we're listening to Paul and to Peter and to Jesus, unless we understand that there is a history, a biblical history uh, of the progressive revelation beforehand, we will be limited in our understanding of Scripture. So the first reason why we must preach the prophets is because we need to follow the example of Jesus and the New Testament writers. The second reason, or the second main reason, is not just because of a desire to imitate Jesus and the apostles, but because we will recognize the value of the message of the prophets. I think it's fee and Stuart that define the prophets as covenant enforcement mediators. And the reason why they do that is because they highlight that in a sense, the prophets were not bringing, they were not delivering a new message, but they were enforcing the covenant that the Lord had already established with the people of Israel. And if you consider that covenant, the heart of the covenant is this sentence. I will be their God and they will be my people. And so when we look at the message of the prophets, we see that they help us to understand both these aspects of the core of the covenant. They give us an incredible description of God. And they also give us a very sobering description of our own sinful condition. The prophets were very good at exposing our sinfulness. They were experts at exposing sin. And they give us a sober diagnosis of our hearts. In a day in which there was plenty of religious ritualism, they help us to see the true condition of the human heart. And they tell us that our condition is that we are corrupt from head to the toe. They tell us that our hearts are deceitful. They tell us that our good deeds are worthless and that our sinfulness is perpetual. It's not particularly flattering to read the prophets because of how accurate their description is of the human heart. And more than that, they don't just explain our sinfulness. They help us to feel our sinfulness. And that's the reason why they used so many metaphors. The the prophets are full of metaphors because they want us to feel the gravity of our condition before God. They call the people of Israel a, a prostitute, an unfaithful wife. They, I think it's uh, Jeremiah that calls them a donkey in heat to describe how prone they were to abandoning Yahweh and serving other gods. They described the rich ladies in Israel as fat cows. (laughs) They were brave, the prophets, but they help us to see, they expose our sinfulness and they help us to see what we are really like. But more than that, they don't, don't just help us to see what we are like. More importantly, they help us to see the character of God, the greatness of God. And I think it's fair to say that the prophets were radically God-centered. God is the major player throughout the prophetic books. And they describe God in his transcendence and God in his imminence. He is both all par- the all-powerful creator, and yet he is also a passionate husband 
he is willing to win back his unfaithful bride. He is both the Holy One of Israel, who's other, completely different, completely distinct from us, and yet he is also a forgiving father. When we consider the characteristics of God that we see in the prophets, I think the description that Jonathan Edwards uses about Christ applies. Jonathan Edwards talks about the admirable conjunctions of diverse excellencies, where you have two characteristics of God that seem as if they are incompatible, and yet they come together. And when you see these excellencies coming together, they become even more admirable. And so we see that the Lord is both the supreme sovereign in the prophets. He is supreme over all the nations. He is supreme over all of creation. He is more powerful than the Assyrians, more powerful than the Babylonians, more powerful than the Persians. Actually, these superpowers are nothing more than instruments in his hand. And yet, he is also the shepherd that lovingly and tenderly cares for his people. And when you bring these two elements together, you have a wonderful picture of God. He is the one for whom the nations are nothing more than a drop <laughs> in a bucket. And yet he carries his lambs in his arms. Or else we see in the prophets that the Lord is both the judge and yet he is also the gracious saviour, an admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies. And so if we want to help our people enlarge their view of God, we must spend time in the prophets. If we want our people to recognize and to feel and to know that the Lord is sovereign, and yet he is also the caring shepherd, then we must spend time in the prophets. If we want our people to recognize the holiness of God and yet the grace of God, then the prophets will help us do this. As Donald Leggett has pointed out, a failure to preach from the Old Testament, in particular a failure to preach from the prophets, results in the loss of the Bible's unique understanding of God. So that's the second reason why I think we should preach the prophets, not just to imitate Jesus and the apostles, but, but because we recognize the value of their message, the inspired message that God gave the prophets for us. Now very quickly, let me just add a third reason for us to preach the prophets. A third reason is because of the genius of their rhetoric. Now the prophets, they're not simple preachers like us because their sermons became part of the word of God. Or to be more accurate, some of their sermons, some of their oracles became part of the word of God. But yet, there are many similarities between the prophets and preachers. And if we spend time with the prophets, we will learn from them. Spending time with the prophets, it's like spending time with an experienced preacher. <laughs> you learn simply by being with them. And we don't just learn from what they said. We also learn by how they lived their lives and we learn from their method, or to put it in other terms, we learn much from their ethos, from their logos, and from their pathos. From their ethos, meaning the way in which they lived their life. The way in which they were unwilling to compromise and to dilute the word that God gave to them, even though it was unpopular. If you think of the prophets and how much they suffered 
because of how unpopular their message was. Think of Jeremiah and the difficult days and the difficult times that Jeremiah had and how tempting perhaps it was for him to compromise and dilute the message like the false prophets. And yet he persevered and he had courage and he was faithful to the task that the Lord gave him. And I think in many ways, we too face similar temptations, a temptation to dilute the word of God, a, a temptation to simply preach something we know will be pleasing to our people. And yet the prophets tell us, they lead by example and they show us that we must have the courage to proclaim the undiluted word of God. We also learn much from their logos, uh, the logic of their or or oracles. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to understand exactly the logic that they used. But one thing is clear in all of the oracles is that the prophets had one big idea. <laughs> this was long before Haddon Robinson. The prophets were preaching one big idea, a main theme in each of their oracles. They had some illustrations, they had some metaphors, uh, they usually had a, a catching, a gripping introduction, but they had one big idea. And spending time with them will help us to sharpen this important aspect of our preaching, of preaching one big idea. But perhaps the greatest area of strength of the prophets was their pathos. They spoke with passion. They did not simply want to explain the word of God. They wanted to persuade the people of the word of God. And to do that, they used plenty of metaphors. And I think if we want to upgrade our preaching, we need to make sure that we are investing time, investing sermon minutes, not just in explaining the passage of Scripture, but of persuading our people of the truth of Scripture. And the prophets will help us do that. So here are three reasons why I think we should preach the prophets. The example of Jesus and the New Testament writers the value of the message of the prophets and the genius of their rhetoric. After all, the prophets were preachers and preachers demand to be heard. So I hope this has helped you just to be motivated for the next few sessions. It's not easy to preach the prophets. Most of us feel much more comfortable in the Gospels or in the Pauline epistles. Uh, this is uncharted territory for many of us. And so I hope these reasons will help us, will convince us of the importance of preaching Tota Scriptura, the whole counsel of God.